Welcome to Midweek Liberty. I'm Jay Dylan Proctor. And I'm Anthony Allegria. And today we're going to be talking about the Protestant Reformation. Here in 2017, we're at the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, and it's a very important thing historically, and it's something that we really need to talk about. But I don't want our discussion to end just at the Reformation. I want us to be moving towards enlightenment, because if there's anything I think we need in our world, I think people need to move back towards a, a thinking of enlightenment. So we'll be discussing what enlightenment is, and we'll have a quick overview of the, the Reformation as well. But that's what we're going to be discussing today. Regardless of where you are in your own faith, enlightenment should be something that we're all interested in. Yeah, it's it's something where the Reformation and the Enlightenment, which really comes in the, the soil which is is prepared out of the Reformation, they're some of the biggest things we've had in history. Pretty much people who are very objective examiners of history, whether they're secular or people of faith, they will recognize that two of the biggest things that have happened in history is the printing press and the Protestant Reformation. Really, if you look at the timeline between the Gutenberg Press and what Martin Luther was doing in the Protestant Reformation, you can really see both helped the other become very relevant and very important and very powerful. So we're going to be looking at all of that here in a few minutes. Also, today is All Saints Day, which is the day that all which is the day that the church celebrates all the people who were saints, both known and unknown and people who are saints currently. Yeah, and in in light of the Reformation and in light of All Saints Day, I have a bow tie on today. I don't normally wear a bow ties. They have a, sort of have a weird place in the, the hierarchy of society. Um, one should not wear bow ties all the time. It, it really puts you at a weird place socially. But I'm a Nazarene clergy, ordained in the Church of the Nazarene. I have to pay respect to the saints who have come before me. The early people in the Church of the Nazarene, all the men, the early holiness preachers, they all wore bow ties. So the bow tie is in reference to, to really the, the Enlightenment era and the, the movement of saints and the early holiness movement paying my respects to those who came before me. All right, so Halloween is the eve of All Saints Day. If you're wondering about what All Saints Day is, it's just that, like I said, it's the day we celebrate saints. And to really understand a day of celebrating saints, we have to know what the word saints means. Saints simply means holy ones, people who are living holy lives. It's not necessarily people who are just these extraordinarily figures in the world. It's just people who are, who are godly people who are actually manifesting the behaviors that Christ called us to. That's not necessarily the people who are defined as saints by by official organizations who give someone sainthood. It can be anybody who's living right, somebody who's been genuinely influential in your life in a meaningful way. Those are people who are saints. May not be the people who call themselves saints, but they're the people who, who match the, the true description. Well, we'll be back here in a second, and we'll take a quick look at the Enlightenment and get things going. <laughs> So just before the break, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about the Enlightenment, but in order to get to the topic of Enlightenment, we really have to talk about the Reformation. It's something which is so powerful for us to, to examine the Protestant Reformation. I know we live in a, a world that's highly secular, and even people who are Christian don't necessarily always have the, the deepest and well-developed theology. And even within the church, outside of the church, people are very quick to do away with traditions. It only takes us a few seconds to throw out things such as religion, religious history, traditions, the way that we have structured things in the church. But it takes a lifetime, and even more than a lifetime, to understand how many of these things transcend history, how they transcend cultures and worlds. There are so many things that are a part of who we are. Truths, the teachings of Jesus, the, the really the, the broader philosophy, the broader openings that came out of the Reformation, which have outlasted cultures, they've outlasted languages, they have outlasted the lifetime of people. Many of the truths we have within the faith, the things which are reliable, have transcended so many things in the world. It's important that we don't just throw those out. We're not keeping tradition because we're, we're scared to, to challenge tradition. Scared and fear are very particular things. We're not talking about that. We're recognizing that some of these things are so powerful. They've outlasted cultures, people's lifetimes, they've outlasted languages, they've outlasted single written text. And that's a very powerful thing. It's not easy to create something that has that sort of endurance. So let's talk about the Reformation a little bit. There were actually several Reformations that took place at around the same time. Yeah, in France, you see some, some things going on with people who are, again, there's some 
efforts to reform things within the Catholic Church. You have Calvin in Switzerland. And of course, later in, in really this, this era when Martin Luther's around, you see the really a split in England where the, the Anglicans move away from the Catholics. That's where the Anglican Church comes from. It's really more of a power split than anything else. But you have more than just one Protestant Reformation. You're really seeing a, a splitting of power. But Martin Luther is unmistakably one of the most powerful figures in all this, and it's important for us to talk about this. A lot of us, when we think of Martin Luther, we may immediately think of the 95 Theses, which was there placed on the door. And that's a, a really important thing to understand. But just to give you a quick overview of what Martin Luther was upset about, we have three things we'd like to talk about, and that's transubstantiation, papal bulls, and indulgences. Just to give you a quick overview of what Martin Luther was so upset about with the, the church, or the Catholic church, Catholic with a big C being the name of the domination, but Catholic with a small C is the idea of the universal church, the, the church which is the universal general body of Christ. All right, so first we're going to mention transubstantiation real quick. And I know that's a big word, and it can be really boring to hear big words like that. But transubstantiation is basically the idea that when people take communion, and we've got a picture of communion you can think of there, it's the idea of people having wine or, or grape juice or some sort of red drink that they take along with bread, the unleavened bread. Of course, that's what Christ tells people at the Last Over. The tradition goes all the way back to Moses and crossing the Red Sea and people escaping out of Egypt and having that moment of remembrance. But basically, transubstantiation was the idea that when you take the holy sacraments, when you take the, the bread and the, the wine, when you take this to, to drink and eat, transubstantiation is that it literally turns into blood and it literally turns into flesh and bones when you eat these. And Martin Luther had a bit of a problem with that. You can see why. Uh, people are not generally can cannibals. And transubstantiation was something he took issue with that there's still power in the ceremony without demanding that it's actually Christ's blood and actually Christ's flesh and bones. So the next thing we need to talk about is papal bulls. And yes, that is B-U-L-L, -L, like a the cattle, like the bovine. But papal bulls were also something that that he had a problem with, Martin Luther did. Papal bulls are essentially the Pope's royal decrees. And just to, to talk a bit about this, a royal decree is something that's put out. It's really not able to be questioned by anybody. And it's, it's a very powerful thing when a, a king puts out a, a royal decree. But the Pope, he was putting out his own decrees, and those were the papal bulls. And this is an extremely huge amount of power to be given to any single man in the kingdom of God. If you look at the early churches, there was no such power given to any single man. It, was, it always belonged to a group of holy men. Well, even if you say within the church... Really, the Pope had power that was not questionable by any living being. The Pope really was saying, I have the authority of God to say something which is unquestionable. And Martin Luther really had a problem with that. And yeah, even within the church, it's a lot to concentrate power that much. But to concentrate that much power even beyond it, again, the, the church at that time was very connected with politics. It's extraordinarily, it's so close to the edge of corruption to have power concentrated that well. Even when you have somebody good there, the chances that somebody bad is going to come seize that power is, is pretty, pretty likely so. It's bad that power would be con concentrated like that. Well, the last thing on the list is indulgences, and we've got a nice picture for you of, of judgment, where people, some people are being judged one way, some people are being judged another way. Um, not the best idea of, indulgent, or of judgment, but all the same, indulgences is this idea of that. Some people are, are sent to, to purgatory, some people are sent directly on down to hell, and if you pay money, you can get your, your loved ones out of hell. You can get them out of purgatory. It's basically paying money for people to have salvation. Martin Luther comes along and says, no, we're justified by grace. We do not need to pay money for people to find salvation. This is a very bad, bad thing. The Reformation opened the door for the rebirth of the world and opened the door for new ways of thinking. Yeah, the Reformation is so powerful, and you may say, oh, this is just religious history, we don't need this. It opened the door for power no longer being concentrated on one group of people, particularly being the Pope and maybe a few high-ranking people, bishops and cardinals and whatnot, but now power is something where the, the local individual, you as an individual, you could interact with scripture, you could interact with theology, you could have personal authority in your life, and you don't need to go pay money to someone to find salvation, but you can instead find information, you can have your own personal relationship developed, and it's a very powerful thing because it takes power from being concentrated to going down to individuals. 
it amazes me that so many people in our world think the only solution to problems is we can have government policies to do things. It is always a terrible idea to have, have power and things offered up to people. Uh, the more power that we can keep along the individual level, the more freedom we have. And Martin Luther opens the door for, for individual freedom and individual liberty by taking power from being a very centralized thing to being a very local thing. And that's really one of the things that comes out of this. And we'll be back here in a second and take the logical step from Reformation to the new life we're called to in an era of enlightenment. All right, so out of the Reformation, the world then really is fertile soil for the Enlightenment. A lot of people will talk about the Enlightenment and say, oh, it's a scientific movement. And other people say, well, no, it's, it's sort of an extension of the Reformation. The Enlightenment is really this new era where people are free to think for themselves. They're free to develop ideas in critical thinking. People as individuals are free to have minds which pursue really complicated thoughts, and they can, they can own truth as individuals. They can personally interact with truth in the world. They can personally do things which are very, very meaningful in, in the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of, of, of really just the worldly things, of spiritual things, of, of everything around us. We as an individual don't have to look to some external authority for it, but we can seize the day with, with our own life. We can have a personal relationship with God, and we can use that in, our, in, in the way that we're individually called. We don't have to rely on some external force, some external government for, for our, our rights and for our, our living. So when you think of enlightenment, think of free thinking, and that's so important. And it's also important not to separate out the religious and the scientific side of it. So many people want to do this, but I think that's an over-separation that's not really necessary, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Some say we're still in the era of enlightenment, but that's pretty hard to argue. I think it's really hard to argue. Even though we have the most access to information that we've ever had in human history, still people are radically honed in on specific maxims, on specific ideologies. They have specific things that they, they perceive to be true, and they want to connect themselves to that, and they don't want to hear anything which causes friction ideology. Again, the path of least resistance is not just a, a thing in terms of physics. It's a thing in terms of social things. People do not like friction. They don't want ideas that conflict their ideas. They just want something which is easy to hear. And so we have information, but people are not very interested in being enlightened as individuals. So I want us to read real quick out of G.K. Chesterton and see what he has to say about the relationship between science and religion real quick. So, Anthony, if you would, you would pull up that and read for us out of G.K. Chesterton. Again, this is his book, Orthodoxy. It's free on Amazon Kindle. It's public domain text. I encourage you to read it. It's very fun. Modern masters of science are much impressed with the need of beginning all inquiry with a fact. The ancient masters of religion were quite equally impressed with that necessity. They began with the fact of sin, a fact as practical as potatoes. Okay, Chesterton, brilliant writer, brilliant thinker, he makes this very obvious statement that so many people in our world are easy to overlook. They're, they say, well, well, this is how we, we're thinking now. We have the scientific method, so we're just going to throw away everything that came before that. I think it's really lazy thinking, and it's really dismissive of stuff which is permeated throughout time. It's transcending cultures, languages, everything you could ever imagine. Some of the, the truths we have that, that have brought us morality and whatnot. So Chesterton says both the scientific mind and the religious mind, they actually start from the same point, but they have different functions. They have different angles that they're going about this from. The religious mind, they look at the fact of sin. They look at the fact of brokenness in the world. You know, they look at the fact that you get up in the morning, you go to labor in the field, and it's like the field hates you. It's, it's like there's this great tragedy of the struggle to just survive and, and create enough food to live. Where the scientific mind looks at it and says, we want to know why the field works like it is. We can look at the, the religious mindset and say, this person just took it upon themselves to kill their brother. There's some sort of sin. They're missing the mark. Again, sin... For those who are not familiar with what the, the language of sin actually means, the oldest definition of sin is an archery term, which means missing the mark. A lot of times we think of sin as this sort of religious term, but it simply just means when something misses the mark. When the earth misses the mark, you know, why? Where for the religious mind, we look at this and we look to see the, the functionality of it, the practicality of it, whereas the scientific mind looks at it also with the question why, but looking at the, the how it works in a very different angle. But again, they're very complementary of one another. One of them looks at sort of the functional reality of it, and the other one looks at sort of the objective material reality of it. 
We can study the material reality of things, but that doesn't tell us how to interact with it. The purpose of religion is to figure out how to interact in a world of objective and in a world of material things. So they're very complementary of one another. The idea of we need to know how things work materially, but knowing how things operate materially doesn't tell us how to behave in it. So we have other things that tell us how to behave in it. We learn things from, from religious texts. We learn things from, from faith. And that's how the two go together. And again, a lot of people will claim we're still in an era of enlightenment. We have a great opportunity for enlightenment, but people are choosing the path of least resistant and moving away from it. Well, how would we return to enlightenment? All right, so I do want people to have a positive takeaway from this video, and we're about to wrap things up. We do need to move back towards enlightenment, and the way we do this is we pursue truth. The truth will set you free. Yes, that is something Jesus says. We find that in the gospel message, but it's a very practical thing. We will be set free when we pursue truth. And the way we do this is we have the tools for valuing things. Last week, we talked about Chesterton, and we read where he discusses the lunatics and how the lunatics are people who find meaning in everything. We don't have to find arbitrary meaning in everything. You don't have to look at the world and see everything is this external force of power or oppression. Look at the world and say, what can I do as an individual to take personal responsibility, personal responsibility for things of truth? Not everything in the world requires moral conviction, so only be morally convicted about things which require moral conviction. This is one of the things that the, the lunatics do, and this is how you get people manipulated. If you can add moral conviction to stuff that's not an issue of morality, we see people do this all the time with issues in our culture. People take it as a personal effect, or this is a personal threat to me if you discuss this. Don't do that. Don't make everything a moral issue. Make things that are actually moral issues, moral issues. But don't make everything in life a moral issue. It doesn't matter where you put your cup on the table. It's not that big of a deal. Don't be a, a moral tyrant. Don't be the lunatic that sees too much meaning in everything. Be someone who is personally responsible for truth. Be someone who, who asks, you know, who am I? Why am I here? I want to be self-aware about my situation. Don't be so quick to dismiss things of the history that, that have transcended time, culture, written languages, spoken languages. Don't be so quick to dismiss these things, but instead be somebody who says, I don't know anything about how the world works or how to function in it, but we're going to pursue truth and we're going to focus on truth, and that is how we will find freedom. Don't rely on other people to pursue truth. Be somebody who takes it upon yourself to pursue truth, and that's how we will return to enlightenment. Well, we're going to leave things there, and I hope you enjoyed our, our video today. If you enjoy us, please subscribe. Please share our content. I'm excited to say we're now on iTunes. If you go to iTunes and, and you go to looking for podcasts, if you do a search for Kingdom of the Logos, you can find us there on podcast. And again, that's spelled L-O-G-O-S and Logos, Kingdom of the Logos. You can find us there. We're also on SoundCloud. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kingdom of the Logos. You can go to YouTube, do a search for Kingdom of the Logos. You will find us there. Please subscribe. Please share our content. And with that, I hope you have a blessed day.